Hello and welcome to GG Weekend Watch, kindly sponsored by Bet UK and the now award-winning GG Weekend Watch. Might I so proudly add thank you so much to each and every one of you who voted for us as the best betting podcast. That your support does not go unnoticed. Thank you so much for tuning in for your comments each week. We really do appreciate every single one of you. And further congratulations are in order because we had the one-two in the best free horse racing tips the competition as well daryl and andrew very well done to both of you and extra plaudits go to daryl as well because he finished second in the best overall free tipster as well so guys absolutely smashing it and just a personal one from me a huge thank you to both of you two for making this show exactly what it is today so that's enough of the pleasantries and all of the pats on the back though because that's all in the past now we can rest on our laurels somewhat but we do have plenty to look forward to in the future because the future is very bright we have the 2023 royal ascot meeting on the horizon and we will crack on straight with the action we're going to give you a podcast for each day talk through every single race naps or best bets for that day at the end and then we'll move on to the next day in our next show because we had better crack on because we begin with a bang this is with the group one queen Anne for the older horses over a mile at 2 30 on tuesday the appleby stalwart that is modern games heads the betting from inspiral for the godstons with uh, that man, Frankie Dottori, on board, who will be having all eyes on him throughout the week. And she'll feel like she's surrounded by a sea of blue because Native Trail is in next around 6-1. to one. So, Daryl, would you like to kick us off, please? Yeah, cracking week's worth of action. Uh, I think it's going to be important to try and get ahead on the first two days because the way the decks are coming, all the entries are coming in, it looks very, very tricky indeed. Um, Frankie's going to be a big factor this week, I think. I think following him, you, you won't go too far wrong, given it's his final Royal Ascot, and he's going to be jumping on, you know, he's going to have this pick of the rise, I would assume. Yeah, Modern Games head to Mark here, won the lockings last time out. I thought that was a, a career-best performance from him. Uh, it quickened up really nicely. Chindit tried to take a chunk out of him at the finish. Yeah. And you think, well, maybe Chindit was idling a little bit in front, and because uh, he, he ran on it again a little bit um towards the end so he's probably going to be popular for for an each way bet he likes it here at ascot um but i do like the vibes coming from the camp of batting spiral um and i do think that she is potentially the best horse in the race she fluffed their lines last year at newmarket behind prosperous voyage and then again here at ascot in october on champions day when beaten by bayside boy but i still think she's shaped like the best horse in that race modern games finished second there I do think she finished with plenty of running left and uh on her day she's a very 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 smart horse and we know she goes well fresh the Tatori factor to kick us off in the opener hopefully um of those at bigger prices you, you can make sort of small cases for a lot of them i guess light infantry um even move to Salbeck. i think it's going to be a genuinely truly run race i think you're going to have lucille pushing on pogo triple time's not going to be far away chinned it so I do think we're going to get a truly run race. I think triple time interests me the most out of those at bigger prices. I think there's more to come from this lad. Um, I know Kevin Ryan has mentioned him multiple times in uh, saying they hold him in high regard. So I do think he's got more to offer around 28 to 1. I'd forgive the run in France last the last day. I think it was far too soft for him. 28 to 1. I think you can go well each way, but in spiral for the win only punters out there. Um, obviously, this is all dependent on draw, etc. Um, we'll go, we'll talk about that more as we get through, I'm assuming. Yeah, and like you say, we do just have to make that pretty clear as we record on a Friday afternoon now, so we don't have your odds uh, or really all that much kind of those key extra details to go on. But the lads' columns will be up every day, they fall Royal Ascot with those further details. This is just to give you an idea of exactly where we're thinking at the minute. But in Spiral, the main win play for Daryl at this stage, Andrew? So I thought this was the Cheltenham Festival preview. I've not, I've not looked at uh, Royal Ascot. <laughs> no, those I'm... draws don't count for anything with that. Exactly. <laughs> I'm in the I'm in the Daryl camp with in Spiral. Uh, I actually wrote her, her run up in the Falmouth Stakes as a positive one when she was chinned uh, by Prosperous Voyager odds of seven to one on. Uh, although there was only five runners, there was a massively strong bias that day. If you were anywhere near that far side rail, you didn't have a prayer. And uh, she had the worst of the draw, raced on the slowest part of the track. And um, I said she'd bounce back next time. She did. 
uh, winning in Group One company in France, and I think you can give the forgive the um, Champions Day run at the end of a long hard season. She goes well with fresh, and uh, assuming she gets away on terms this time, I think she's going to take all the beating. Uh, I was on a Ascot preview panel on Tuesday in London with Rory Delaghi. He made an excellent case for triple time. And on the day, I'll be looking for something to back each way that's likely to be ridden patiently. We know, patiently, we know what Ascot's like. Generally, don't want to be on the front end. Daryl's already said you know, the other will. There does look like there's going to be plenty of pace here. Uh, I was originally lo looking at Cash, but um, he's going to run at um, York on Saturday, by, by, by all accounts. Light infantry possibly being trained by Simcock and ridden by Jamie Spencer. You'd expect to be ridden prominently, but did make the running in France last time out. Was held up the time before. So uh, if he reverts to patient tactics um, and there's a bit of cut because he's by fast company, there is rain forecast on Tuesday. There may be light infantry to get a place. Same with um, uh, check and challenge needs... Um, Need to rain, and we've seen um, you know William Knights you know, get big price placed horses in this race before. Uh, but yeah, in spiral for me, um, triple time next best. There's your uh, there's your exactor. Oh, there you go. Well, both of you two are now awful. Easy, easy just for Ascot stuff, isn't it? Isn't it exactly? Yeah, just straight away, straight off the bat. There, the pair of you two agreeing, going in with the exactor as well. Job done. Right. See if we can continue that into the Coventry. Huh, lol. Um, this is the first <laughs> two-year-old race that we have. The Group Two Coventry, of course, over six furlongs at three oh five. And there has been some late action throughout the morning, as I say, as we record on Friday afternoon, as um, a sadner has been on the drift and the support has come for River Tiber. So, Andrew, what are we doing now with the Coventry? Yeah, it's a tricky one. Um, so when I was looking at this earlier in the week, it was, a, I think there were 11 to 4 joint favourites, River Tiber and Sadna. The prices I'm looking at now, I've got uh, River, Tiber, River Tiber at 7 to 4 against 4 to 1 for Sadna. Sadna, the speed figure horse, I know um, uh, Andy Holding was raving about this one's performance uh, when he won by 12 lengths at Ripon. Um, yeah, I'm not totally um you know enamored with sort of ripping form going to royal ascot so despite what the clock says and uh quite a strange place to take a you know a good two-year-old given the ridgy nature of the track and uh, how some horses simply don't handle it now i've no strong opinion either way um everyone tells me that one of these two will win and um no nothing else has got a prayer so uh, yeah i'll probably try and stab out something each way at a price on the day in the hope of the draw you know, it gives us a few clues in, in the Queen Anne. Um, but yeah, I'm just going to sit this one out. Yeah, sit this one out for now then and just like you say, wait for the draw and potentially in each way play for Andrew in the Coventry, Daryl. Any further convictions? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm quite strong on, on River, River Tiber, especially given I was given a bit of a nod this morning that Asadna's going to be a non-runner. Um, yeah. Uh, he's, uh, I think he suffered a, a, quite a big cut. So, um but hopefully he's okay. But yeah, as Andrew mentioned, he put up a, a massive time figure at, at Ripon. Um, it, it was very visually impressive as well. But the, the, I mean, the, those in behind were just, they just ran no sort of race. If you can compare it to the other race on the card, they would have finished miles behind anything that day, really. Um, but he, anyway, he's not running. Uh, the, the second on the list in terms of speed figures for me was, was River, River Tiber. So um, he's naturally the one you go to, and I think he's going to improve significantly going up from five to six. Uh, I was just really taken with the way he finished his race off at, at Nace last time, beating Tourist. Um, that, that's not, not a bad piece of form either, and I think he's going to improve a, a good bit. I see a couple of comments, Aidan O'Brien was saying that nothing can get him off the bridle at home, and little bits and pieces like that. So everything seems to add up to him being a pretty strong favourite. And when this Asadna comes out, I think he's going to be a pretty short price. There's a few down here. Um, the, the third sort of on the list for the speed figure was Thunder Blue, who's Goodwood run last time. Uh, this is a nice horse. I don't know which one they're going to run, Thunder Blue or uh, their other one for Adrian Murray. Um, but this horse is at no slouch, that's for sure. 20 to 1 is a fairly big price for him. And again, sort of looking down the field, I don't know who's going to run, but the likes of Bob Slade, Hatam, and Flag of St. George for Jane Chapelheim, those are horses sort of to keep on side, whether it be at Royal Ascot or, or down the line. I think Bob Slade's going to drop back and trip. I'm not sure about Hatam. Um, but for me, everything just points to River Tiber, and I think it takes like a world of beating, really, in this. Yeah, he's now seven to four, but like I say, if Hatamna does then officially come out, I mean, what price is he going to go off at with, with those who vying for favourites and the whole yeah. way long? And it's still, it's still an anti-post market at the moment. So, yeah, I mean, it'd probably be out by the time this goes out. But if he's not, I would back River Tiber if I was you. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. It it feels like Cheltenham, to be fair, with these last minute defections and such like. So yeah, we'll you'll probably know when you're watching this what's actually happened with the commentary. Um, but as it currently stands, we don't at the minute. But hopefully, we'll we will know what will be turning up in the King's Stand because speedsters very much to the fore here. The Group One over the Flying Five furlongs for three odds and over at three forty. Plenty of international interest here as well. But it's still the home representative that heads the way. High princess as the five to two favorite but daryl how are you playing it yeah well oh, i was i was going through every single runner in this race like quite in like i was in the zone with this and uh <laughs> I, I sort of almost came down on, on mitt barhi um, i thought he had an outside chance but i was just worried that he's going to get rushed off his feet early doors and and like as much as everybody likes to think that horses coming from off the pace here are going to have a great chance so a lot of the times in these five final sprints the pace holds up and if you can't go that early tempo you're in big big trouble being rousted along from for much of the race and some horses just can never get back on the bit so i'm slightly worried about him i, I might i mean i've got to see the draw in front of that but i might I, I do like his chance i think he's got more to come i think there's excuses for some of his below par runs and I don't see why he should be something like a 25 to one shot and Manacan should be an eight to one shot in all honesty so I, I do like him but i've got more reservations i was looking at chips then as well i think he's an improver this season i think that he stays six furlongs he, he'll enjoy this stiff five i think um but again is he going to be rushed off his feet early doors he was a little bit off the bridle with york last time before getting back into the part into the mid race and then kick it on i just i'm just not entirely happy with those sort of runners to be honest um so i ended up coming back to highfield princess she travels beautifully she's got a great record at, at five fair of course she was fantastic last year at, at the cara um i think you can forgive her a run in the breeders cup when she was beating one and three quarters lengths even though that's no bad piece of form but she was checked on the turn and i'm not entirely convinced that she wants a, a bend uh, i think she's better on a straight track great seasonal return uh giving weight to azure blue who's a, again a progressive horse the time figure was good that day uh i think coming back to five is definitely what she wants and i, I just think she's probably going to be very hard to beat so yeah high from princess i'm gonna do Ah, oh, waving the little Union Jack there. We like that a lot for Daryl for the British speedster to beat the international contingent coming over. So Hyper Princess for Daryl, Andrew, who are you siding with? Yeah, this is one of the best races of the week, I think. Um, Highfield Princess was fantastic last year. And um, I was really impressed with that comeback run over six in the uh, Clipper Stakes at York. Um, she was the best of those ridden prominently. The winner, the third and fourth, all came from off the pace. Uh, I thought that marked her down as uh, one to support next time. And um, she'll be in my, you know, sort of exact sort of trifecta combinations. Uh, Dramatised, I wanted to take on because I thought that she was flattered by that Temple Stakes win. The four highest draw horse, four highest drawn horses were one, two, three, four. Now, because I've obviously been following the um, low drawn runners out of the Temple Stakes, and um, you had um, the horses in fifth, sixth, and seventh who all ran really well from low draws down the middle of the track. Best of those was Mitt Barhi, and that's the only one I've backed anti post for, for this race. Uh, Happy Romance in sixth place uh, from stall two. That was a huge effort. Now, you know, arguably, she's better over sixth, even uh, a little bit further. But uh, she's the kind of horse who, on the day, you know, I wouldn't mind backing each way at a big price if there's an extra places on offer because although she will get taken off her feet early, she will be putting in good work at the finish. And she ran well in the um, platy jubes. Um, uh, yeah. Show me can't call it that this time around. She was poorly drawn towards the far side and um, you know, sort of kept on well that day. So, um, yeah, mid Midabahi shortlist, Highfield Princess, um, uh, Happy Romance, and Manikan, you know, have to be the other one given uh, his course form and the fact the ground was probably too soft when he was third on his debut. Those, those are the four that were going to be in my sort of, you know, tote place part combination trifectas and exactors. But in terms of a bet, I will bet, uh, I've bet Mid Mitt Barhi and I'll also bet Happy Romance on the day. Okay, then, yeah, Mitt Barhi, Dar who Daryl mentioned at the start, they're 25 to 1 and Happy Romance 40 to 1 currently priced up at. And if you're marking your GG Weekend Watch bingo card, Patty Jeeves, there you go, first one up. Now, the one who I want to come down on the side of, 20 to 1, no one's talked about her, apart from me, apparently, uh, Twilight Gleaming. 
in here. The Wesley Ward run. I feel like I'm going to be flying an American flag for a fair few races at Royal Ascot this year. But she is a really smart filly. And Wesley Ward has used his general MO with a filly going to this type of race at Royal Ascot. And she has Ascot form to her name already anyway. Came as a two-year-old. When she finished second in the Queen Mary, she went on to win the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies Turf, uh, no, Juvenile Turf the same season. And then she showed plenty on her reappearance when she won the Listed Giants Causeway Stakes in a stakes record time as well. That race, Wesley Ward used with Lady Aurelia before she went on to win the King Sand. And he also used it with Campanelli before she went on to finish third in the Platy Dupes. So a race that Wesley Ward uses to optimal effect time and time again. And Twilight Gleaming, as you say, Daryl, where you don't really want a horse that should be coming from off of the pace. She won't be. She'll be fine. She'll be flying up there. So she was the one for me at 20 to 1, but cannot wait for the flying five in the King stand. Now, more group one action up next in the form of the St. James's Palace Stakes for three year olds over a mile at 420, which looks hugely competitive. Uh, but it is the two. 2000 guineas winner chaldi or caldi and apologies who heads away as the two to one favorite so andrew who wins the saint james's palace you mean the jimmy p the <laughs> jimmy p <laughs> no let's not call we're not that. getting any royal invites to anything are we <laughs> well, that, that, that ship so long ago for me anyway a long time ago <laughs> but um yeah i mean Chaldean is um unbeaten in five starts outside of his seasonal debuts obviously i'm seated in one of those and um, he's got obvious claims. I wasn't massively keen on Paddington because I'm just looking to take on all those horses who won from the front at that um, you know Irish Guineas meeting, where there was the typical massive bias um, you know on the round course at the Curra, really difficult to make ground from off the pace. I was quite taken with the performance of Geller on that day, who was. Um, you know, behind Paddington, wasn't beaten a million miles, um, ran a really good race at a big price, 150 to one fourth to Chaldean in uh, the 2000 guineas, ran in the Irish equivalent, beaten three and a half lengths under a patient ride. Given the way the track was riding, that was a huge effort. So I thought each way, you know, when he was 50 to one earlier in the week, I think he's 33s now, you know, I thought he had, um, you know, half a squeak really. So I'll, I'll go Galleron each way here. 33 to 1 Galeron each way then in the, in the Jimmy P, the St. Jimmy P. <laughs> oh, God. At least if you call it the Jimmy P, you don't have to work out where to put the apostrophe, which is one of the hardest parts of all that sort of week. Oh, just of life, to be honest with you. Anyone surname that ends with an S, I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> uh, anyway, that, that problem aside, the problem of who's going to win, Daryl? Oh, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I don't know really, but uh, uh, Galleron that Andrew just mentioned there, he um, that was a really steadily run Irish thousand guineas. Uh, like that, it was turned into a dash from two two out to the line, and uh, it was like the slowest mile race I think over the course of a couple of days there. So um, definitely he's, he's onto an angle there with Paddington being well positioned. Um, he has got more to come though. I I, I kind of think that Chaldean is the best horse in the race. I just. I, just, uh, my problem is I don't really like any of the Guineas form, so I'm very, I'm very, it's very hard for me to be drawn to it. But I also think that Sierra's gift for Charles Hills is very, very short at four to one. I think that's a ridiculously short price, even though he's been very impressive. The form and the, and the clock doesn't really back it up as such yet. Um, but it, he's a nice horse, but I just couldn't take four to one. Mob Staffordshire. Again, is a is another lovely horse. Look, he really quickened up at York. Really, you had to be impressed with the way he did it. But it was it was just a steady run affair that he was on the front end of. He was twelve lengths slower than the finish race on the card. Like it, it's just hard to get a handle on really because the other thing is that John Gosden doesn't normally waste bullets in this race. He does put decent horse. He does put horses in here that have decent chances. So. For me, it's all just a bit of a muddle, and and I'm going to have to use my first no bet, and it's the St James's Palace. Can you believe that? To be fair, we've gone a fair few races. Like I said, I didn't expect it to be this race, but I can completely understand because it is. It's just a muddle. I mean, it's great for viewers though, um, because it's going to be so competitive and it looks so competitive. But it is difficult to have any really strong convictions on any of those at the head of the market. I believed anyway, so I was more than happy to leave it to you guys. Right, Ascot stakes up next. Uh, our first handicap as well. 
heritage handicap 0 to 100 for the four-year-olds and over over two mile four at five o'clock willie mullins the pesky maestro that is willie mullins has the clear favorite here with bring on the night on the back of his lengthy layoff so daryl is it willie's in the bumper this is too short this five to two for bring on the night this is this is too short like you've got a cesaro which we're doing there is third favorite 11 to one mm -hmm. like I, I, I don't know this is short. i think it's 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 literally based on that piece of form of coltrane isn't it so his price is basically based on what coltrane's done since rather than than him um i thought there was an interesting one big big price um flerman frolly murphy uh this this horse um the race at newmark at newcastle last time lowered the course record it was a really really good time it was three seconds inside standing and for a two mile race that's quite unheard of really um and i thought it was a cracker run i think he stays all day he's improving very very quickly that like, he didn't really take the hurdles i guess um but he's been back on the flat in chick pieces and he's just thriving he's just such a strong stayer and you go back to some of his form when he was with uh, ralph beckett and it's it's not so much the form that is impressive but it's the manner of his victories which were impressive and i think there's more to come from him he's very very lightly raced um and he's a massive price 33 to one whether or not he's got enough in hand to win this of 99 i don't know but i can i can sit he will not be fading at the finish put it that way he will be running on and if you can get extra places i think he could be a good each way bet in the race um of, of the others i don't want to say it i don't want to say it <laughs> but he could have a chance he is well handicapped off 88 oh gosh oh there you go there it is it, carry it, on it, carry on he's going right-handed i know the ground's not in his favor but if there's a little bit of rain which i think there's some showers due just to take that sting out of the ground mm -hmm. he's off he's the best rate he's the highest rated herder in the field if i'm not mistaken he's 20 to 1 and he's rated 88 and he's getting tons of weight from you know everything else that goes over hurdles in this race <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think i think gosh it's interesting but again this is sort of like i need to know the draw here as well because i want i want something that's going to be handy or at least midfield in this and uh yeah it, it's difficult to give you a strong opinion but those that those are the couple that i'm looking at at the moment we are more than happy to give you a free pass or a get out of jail free card on a former race if you come back in the next race and tip up a horse like goshen all day long 20 to <laughs> one about that horse but fleur man though the main player at this stage 33 to one for ollie murphy kevin Sott has the ride there at the time of recording andrew um yeah inter interesting about the, the willie mullins angle because we know he does so well in this race um, but he does well with horses who run over hurdles last time out he's, he's four winners from 15 and uh um, four of the beaten horses finished second or third so you know uh, um you know eight of the 15 were in the three scaramanga is the one who qualifies 20 to one second string who um won a three mile con uh, contest over jumps in the usa last time out so i'll give him a squeak now uh, there's a couple of interesting ones who caught the eye against the pace biases at um, goodwood last time out tides of war over a mile six and first emperor over two miles both finished third in their respective races and in those races the winner and second pretty much ran one two throughout and those were the best of the you know the hold-up horses um they're both by galileo which is a slight concern because uh, galileo progeny are not from 22 in this race and uh, i don't think i think only one of those placed um and the other one i was interested in was newfoundland uh, newfoundland who was um three to one favorite uh, and his debut for joseph o'brien but um a mile and a half was too short at Tipperary and uh, yeah, and again, a mile six was looked too short at the current last time out when he was again heavily backed. So I thought he ran much better that time, finishing sixth of 18. He's now up in trip. Um, but I'll go Scaramanga uh, on that Willie Mullins run over hurdles last time out angle. 20 to 1 about Scaramanga. He is also the biggest dude of all time, that horse. I'd absolutely, just for the horse himself, I'd love him to win. He's an absolute legend and he's been, yeah, really well campaigned. So this could well be another pop for him to pick up. Now it's the listed Wolferton stakes for four-year-olds and over, over 10 furlongs at 5.35. An open contest here, Andrew, six to one the field. How are you playing it? If Saga runs, I'll be putting him to finish second to the field, um, you know, in, a, yeah. uh, in trifecta because that's what he does. I think his 10 career runs, he's finished second in five of them and uh, only got being a was ahead of the Britannia stakes um, last year. He'll probably go for the Royal Hunt Cup rather than this race. But if he does run here, 
yeah, certainly um, yeah, don't, don't be backing him uh, to win at short price in running when he looks like he's travelling the best. Um, the other one, uh, but the one I'm probably going to back is um, Lafayette for um, Noel Mead. 33 to 1 I'm, I'm looking at here. Now, um, uh, he ran a good race in Ireland last time out again against the buyers, finishing fourth to Luxembourg, being almost nine lengths, but he was 33 to 1. That was obviously um, in a Group 1 contest, the Tassel's Gold Cup. And uh, again, it was like every race that day, you know, uh, over that weekend at the Curra, winner made all runner up Bay Bridge sat prominent. Um, you know, Pisbadil the third was um, sort of always up there throughout as well. And I um, mean, he was the one who made ground from off the pace. And, you know, da- down in grade, you know, um, going into uh, a handicap company for the first time, I think since finishing third at um, Leopardstown in a field of 23. So, uh, did I say handicap? This is not a handicap, is it? But uh, ignore that bit. Dropping the listed company, sorry, for the first time since um, uh, winning at Nace uh, in March of last year. So, uh, Dowling grade, good run against the bias last time out. Big price, Lafayette. Okay, 33 to 1, as you say, with markets are just kind of forming themselves now, even as we're recording. But 33 to 1, it is about Noel Meads runner. Lafayette, Daryl. Yeah, quite drawn to uh, the unexposed nature of Francesco Clemente. I thought mm-hmm. the run at Goodwood was, was really, really good on his seasonal return. Um, he he was coming around the home bend into the straight and he wanted to go straight on for whatever reason. And Rab Havin didn't have his right hand down, I don't think. And um, he was he lost plenty of lengths and sharply turned. And then he, he just smoothly made headway on King of Con- Conquest. And then was just out battled at the finish because I think he just blew up and needed the run, really. Um, I thought that was a much, much improved effort on his three runs last year, which the form's not really worth anything. But I just thought he'd shake like he was going to improve a good deal. And uh, if he goes in here, I, I think he'll be, uh, I'd be pretty keen on his chances. A uh, big, big price, not Trebel bet. Um, this horse is improving. The last two starts recorded triple figure RPRs um, for the first time in his career. And I think he's screaming that to go back up and triple up to back up to 10. He was over nine last time at, at Newmarket coming from well off the pace in the soft ground. I think it, it paid to be on the pace that day. Uh, this horse has got more to come. Um, I'm just slightly concerned about how quick the ground will be for him. Uh, but Francesco Clemente would be the main play. OK, Francesco Clemente, the main play, not Trebel, but 25 to 1, I can see. Francesco Clemente, 6 to 1, like I say, a few people were fairly sick uh, from that reappearance run. But it was it, it was quite a, a f- <laughs> quite a run, all things considered, considering how much he did wrong. Like I say, he just, just decided to go straight the bonehead. But hopefully this time around, he will have learned plenty from that and will come forwards. Francesco Clemente in the 535. Now, our final race on day one is the Copper Horse Handicap, a 0 to 105 contest for the four-year-olds and over over a mile six at 610. And it's that man, Willie Mullins, yet again. He could easily be the champion trainer at the end of day one, couldn't he, really? Uh, Because he has two hot pots. And if both of them go in, I mean, he's got Vauban this time around. But Daryl, who wins the Copper Horse for you? Yeah, this is the one you want to back. Like, this is the one that's a good price, two to one for Vauban. 160 rated third in the champion hurdle, coming in here off 101. Like, I think he's got a fantastic chance. You go back and watch some of his French form, uh, him running on the flat. He's so quick. And that's the thing about these types of races, right, is that you get put a champion herder in here. They're fast horses, like proper yeah. fast horses. And you put them in two-mile races against two-mile flat horses, the reason the horses on the flat are running over two miles, no one wants two mile though, is because they're slow. And you put Vauban in here, it is gonna he is gonna quicken away from these um of this mark of 101. They're talking about Melbourne Cups with him. Yeah. Like, he's running in the class two handicap of 101 today. Like oh, I don't know, that's that's a bit of me that I think too. The one about <laughs> Vauban. I have that. Um why not do like it just at each way price is ruling di- dynasty for, for Charlie Appleby? I don't know if he'll run because he only ran eleven days ago at Haylock, but this horse has got some serious talent. He will be in the frame. Um, I'll be shocked if he's out of the frame. He's completely unexposed. Three starts. He absolutely dots up at Haydock. And he's in my tracker, and I was going to put him up, but I chose not to um, because I was slightly concerned about King of the Plains. And he just absolutely destroyed him, like really destroyed him. And he drifted as well to 10 to 3. And I was, felt sick afterwards. But... Um, he just destroyed him. He's he's a, he's a smart animal. Time's good as well. Uh, so I think he's got plenty more to come. It'd be quite interesting. They like, turn him out quite quickly and stick him in here of ninety-seven. 
I think that opening rating could underestimate him as well. But the main bet will be Vauban. Small each way cover, I guess, on Rule and Dynasty. Um, but again, we need to see the draw. Vauban could be in the car park. You don't know, yeah, like I say, you don't know at this stage, but Vauban, though, a good bet. Ruling Dynasty at 10-1, to though, for a small each-way play. And, Andrew, I thought you were going to come in with the second tick-off of our bingo card list for a second, then. Yeah, when Daryl said 10-3, to I was going to say 100-30. Uh... There you go, two, two in the first first day that we're recording. There you go. <laughs> good going. Yeah, I've no strong opinion. I'll, I'll be looking. I mean, uh, drawn in the car park is generally where you want to be in the, you know, the round course handicap certainly traditionally it's better to be drawn high than be drawn low but yeah look, looking at the um you know the, the pace angle the draw angle on, on the day will be my um route into this race i was half interested in nuzret um who uh, won the adonis of course for, for joseph o'brien and uh, was a winner on the flat at the current last time out over this mile six trip but um, yeah no strong opinion Okay, no strong opinion. Yeah, Nazareth, though. I mean, the quick round will definitely suit him anyway. That's what they had said previously. So that is day one, each race done and dusted. So all that is left for me to do is to get your naps, please. So, Andrew, I will not take you by surprise. We're not going to take the third one off of our bingo list, will we? Naps, please. I'll get the loser out of the way um, in spiral in the Queen Anne. Well done. Daryl? Uh, I can't really nap Vauban, can I, if I'm going to have an each-way bet in the race as well? People are giving Yeah, sure you them. can. Uh, it's the copper horse handicap, of course. Yeah, yeah. Daryl, you're an award-winning tip, so you can do what you like. You can do whatever you want, yeah. <laughs> as are you, my friend, as are you. <laughs> I'll, um, I'll go Vauban. Yeah, Vauban. Vauban, then, in the concluding race that we have just covered. And I don't really have a nap as such, but I just think best bet at 20 to 1. I can't really not have a play on Twilight Gleaming now in the King stand at 3 40. Right, that is everything for us then on day one of the Royal Ascot Preview. Stay tuned for day two. <laughs>